Number three, Sheila Keene. By the spring of 1990, Marlene Warren, who lived in West Palm Beach, Florida, had been married to her husband, Michael Warren, for 20 years. Michael started off his professional life selling meat, and then he began to buy and sell cars. This eventually led to him opening his own car lot, where he rented and sold used cars. Michael and Marlene also started buying properties, and they rented them out. Marlene worked as the property manager on the rental units. But life wasn't always easy for the couple. In 1983, Michael was arrested for rolling back the odometers on two cars. He pleaded guilty, and he was sentenced to 18 months probation. After the conviction, Michael transferred ownership of the car lot to Marlene. When the couple got married, Marlene had two sons from a previous marriage. In the fall of 1988, Marlene's eldest son, John, was killed in a car crash. He was 22 years old. Two years later, Marlene had become tired of being a landlord. Specifically, she didn't like evicting people. Marlene and Michael were planning on meeting with a real estate agent because Marlene wanted to sell the rental properties. May 26, 1990 was a warm but rainy morning in West Palm Beach. That morning, 40-year-old Marlene was at her home, which was in an affluent neighborhood. Michael left that morning to go to a casino in Miami. At about 11 a.m., the doorbell rang. Marlene answered the door and found a clown in her doorway. The clown's face was painted white and she was wearing an orange wig, a red nose, and white gloves. She was wearing regular high top shoes and not big floppy shoes. The clown was holding some carnations and two helium filled balloons. One of the balloons read, you're the greatest. When Marlene reached out and took the gifts, she said, isn't this nice? Then suddenly, the clown pulled out a gun and shot her once in the face, just above her top lip. Marlene's son heard the gunshot and he ran to the doorway. He saw the clown calmly walk to her white Chrysler LeBaron. She got in and drove away. Marlene's son called 911 and Marlene was driven to the hospital. Marlene survived for two days before she finally succumbed to her wound. In the days after the shooting, Michael was inconsolable. Michael told the police that he and Marlene had a good marriage. But the police did some interviews and it turned out that Michael and Marlene's marriage wasn't as idyllic as Michael made it out to be. A couple named Richard and Sheila Keen did repossessions for Michael's car lot. The couple had several brushes with the law. Richard had once been involved in drug trafficking. Several of Michael's employees of the car lot said that Michael and Sheila were having an affair. Sheila's neighbors often saw Michael at the Keen home when Richard was gone. Both Michael and Sheila were asked about the affair, and they denied it. Supposedly, Marlene knew about the affair, and she was considering getting a divorce. Michael told people he would never get divorced because he didn't want to give up half his assets. One of the biggest problems was that after he was convicted of tampering with the odometers on the cars, he registered the car lot under Marlene's name. That meant on paper, Marlene was the official owner of the lot. Apparently, shortly before she was killed, Marlene told her mother that if something happened to her, Michael was responsible. The police also began to track down where the clown got the car and the gifts. The police found the car that the clown was driving 
abandoned in the parking lot of a shopping center that was less than 10 miles from the Warren's house. The car was a rental car that had been stolen two days earlier. A couple had rented a car from a lot called Payless Car Rental System, which was a short distance away from Michael's car lot. The couple went to drop off the car, but found the lot closed. So they looked up the lot's phone number in the yellow pages. When they thought they found the ad, they called, and a man answered. The man told them to leave the car unlocked where it was, and to put the keys in the visor. The couple did as they were told, and then they left. But they didn't feel comfortable about leaving the car unlocked with the keys inside of it, so they went back to check on the car. When they got back to the car lot, the car was gone. They called the same number back, and the same man answered the phone. But this time, he acted like he had never talked to the couple before. The couple then realized that they had not called Payless Car Rental System, which was the lot they rented from. The yellow page ad they found said Payless in big letters, but the ad was actually for budget auto rentals, which was Michael Warren's car lot. Michael had been sued by Payless Car Rental System over the Yellow Page ad because they called it misleading. The police then began to investigate Sheila Keene. They learned that two years before the shooting, she had dressed up like a clown. She had done it to entertain her infant son and some other children. The police went to a costume shop in West Palm Beach and two clerks said that two nights before the murder, something odd happened. This was the same night that the rental car was stolen. The employees said just as they were closing for the night, a woman came into the shop and she said she desperately needed a clown costume. She got an orange wig, a red nose, white gloves, and enough white makeup to cover her face but she chose not to get the floppy clown shoes. The police asked the two clerks to look at a photo lineup. One of them picked Sheila out of the lineup. He said she was the woman who got the clown costume. The other clerk said that he thought that Sheila was the woman who wanted the clown costume, but he wasn't sure. The police found out that the flowers and the balloons were purchased at a grocery store near the crime scene. Several employees remembered a woman matching Sheila's description purchasing them about 90 minutes before Marlene was shot. They remembered her because she was wearing white gloves. While all this sounded promising, the district attorney didn't think that there was enough evidence to prove that Michael and Sheila were involved in Marlene's murder. Since Michael was never charged with murder, he received a $50,000 payout from Marlene's life insurance policy. In January 1991, Michael was charged with tampering with the odometers on dozens of cars on his lot. He was convicted, and in March 1994, he was sentenced to nine years in prison. He ended up serving just under four years. He was released from prison on New Year's Eve, 1997. While he sat in prison, no progress was made on his wife's murder case. Michael eventually moved away from Florida, and the police lost track of him. They also lost track of Sheila Keene. In 2014, 24 years after Marlene's murder, the police in West Palm Beach reopened the case. They learned that in 2002, Michael and Sheila got married in Las Vegas, Nevada. After they got married, they settled in Abingdon, Virginia, where they ran a popular fast food restaurant. Michael and Sheila had sold the restaurant the year before, and they were now retired. The police had the strands of hair that were found in the stolen car, and other evidence tested for DNA. The DNA was then compared to Sheila's DNA. It was a match. 
In April 2017, Sheila was arrested and she was charged with Marlene's murder. Michael was not arrested, but he has not been ruled out as a suspect. Sheila is expected to go to trial for first degree murder in late 2019. Number 2. Rex Mays July 20th, 1992 started off as a typical summer day in Houston, Texas. In one of the city's quiet neighborhoods, Inwood North, kids were playing outside and enjoying their summer vacation. At around 3.45 that afternoon, 14-year-old Jeremy Garza walked into his family's home. That summer was the first summer that his mother and stepfather let him and his 10-year-old half-sister, Kristen Wiley, stay home during the day while they were at work. Jeremy had spent much of the afternoon playing with his friends just down the street from his house. Kristen and her friend, 7-year-old Kynera Carrero, had spent the afternoon in Jeremy and Kristen's house. Upon entering the house, Jeremy noticed a mess in the kitchen. As he walked to his bedroom, he yelled at his half-sister to come clean up the kitchen. When he got into his bedroom, he was horrified by what he found. His half-sister Kristen and her friend Canera had both been viciously stabbed. The medical examiner later determined that Kristen had been stabbed 25 times and Canera had been stabbed 18 times. Both had been stabbed several times in the face and in the eyes. They were only wearing t-shirts and it's thought that they had been sexually assaulted. The police canvassed the neighborhood for witnesses. The Wiley's next door neighbor, Rex Mays, said that he saw two men running away from the crime scene shortly after the murders. He said one man was black and the other was Hispanic. Mays talked to a police sketch artist, and the sketch of one of the men was released to the public. But several weeks later, the police had Mays take a polygraph, and he failed. He then recanted his witness account, and said he didn't see anyone. This got the police interested in Mays. Why did he go out of his way to lie to them like that? The police thought it was possible that Mays may have lied because he was the killer and he was trying to lead the police astray. Bob Carrero, Canera's father, learned that Mays was a suspect. Bob was a large man with a ponytail and tattoos and he loved motorcycles. Bob and his friends started following Mays around. This included following Mays when he went to work his part-time job which was entertaining children as Uh-Oh the Clown. Mays had been a clown for years before the double homicide and he continued to perform at children's parties even after he became a suspect in the murders of two children. One time Bob went out of his way to tell a woman who had hired Mays to perform at her child's birthday that Mays was a suspected child killer. On February 10th, 1994, 19 months after the double murder, a detective asked Mays to come to the police station for an interview. Mays agreed and he voluntarily went to the police station. Mays and the detective talked for a bit and then Mays said that the guilt was weighing heavily on him. He said that on the day of the murders, he had been fired from Exxon. It wasn't the first time that he had been fired from a job. As he drove home, he thought about how he'd tell his wife that he lost yet another job. He turned onto his street, but he didn't pull into his driveway. His wife had stayed home from her job because she was sick, and he wasn't ready to face her yet. As he sat in the car, he heard loud music coming from Kristen's bedroom, which was on the second floor. He got out of his car walked into Kristen's home through the front door, which was unlocked. He yelled for Kristen to come downstairs.
Kristen, along with Kanera, came downstairs and Mays told them to turn the music down. Kristen refused and told him to get out of her house. Mays said that after he had been fired, Kristen's defiant attitude made something in him snap. He walked into the kitchen while Kristen and Kanera continued to yell at him to leave. May said he picked up a large knife and Kristen told him that she was going to tell her dad on him. He started stabbing the girls and they ran into Jeremy's bedroom where he finished killing them. After he was done, he walked back to his car. He took off his bloodstained shirt and he put it along with a knife and a duffel bag that he kept in his trunk. He then parked his car in his garage. He went inside his home and told his wife that he had been fired. He showered and then he went outside as the police started to arrive. He sat in a lawn chair and drank some coke as he watched the police work. He decided to tell the police he saw two men running away from the crime scene to shift focus away from himself. In September 1995, Faze was found guilty of both murders and he was sentenced to death. While sitting on death row, Faze created an online profile for people looking for pen pals who are in prison. For his hobbies, Faze wrote clowning and country music. On the evening of September 24, 2002, Baze was led to the execution chamber. In his last statement, he asked for people to remember the good and not the bad. At 6.11 p.m., the lethal injection process began, and eight minutes later, 42-year-old Rex Mays, aka Uh-Oh the Clown, was pronounced dead. Number 1. John Wayne Gacy March 17, 1982 was St. Patrick's Day and it was a cool, sunny day in Chicago, Illinois. At one of the city's hospitals, Marion Gacy gave birth to her second child, a son named John Wayne. Gacy had an older sister and two years after he was born, his mother gave birth to her final child, which was another daughter. Gacy's father, John Stanley, was a World War I veteran and an auto mechanic, while his mother was a homemaker. John Stanley was an abusive and sadistic alcoholic who beat his wife and his son. From a young age, Gacy showed signs of disturbing behavior. For example, he was obsessed with his mother's underwear. When he was 10, he was diagnosed with psychomotor epilepsy which caused him to randomly pass out. A year later, he suffered a head injury that resulted in a blood clot that caused him to black out. Five years later, he was given medication to stop the blackouts. Casey didn't do well in high school, and he dropped out. When he was 19, he ran away from home, and he ended up in Las Vegas, Nevada. He worked as an ambulance driver for a short time, and then he got a job as a janitor at a mortuary. Casey was eventually fired because the mortician kept finding clothes from corpses folded in neat piles beside the caskets. The mortician thought that Casey might have been doing something unusual with the bodies, but nothing was ever proven. After losing his job, Casey moved back to Chicago. In September 1964, at the age of 22, Gacy married a woman named Marilyn. After the wedding, Gacy started managing three Kentucky Fried Chicken restaurants that his father-in-law purchased. Within three years of getting married, Marilyn had given birth to a son and a daughter. Gacy was also an active member of his community. He joined the United States Junior Chamber, also known as the JCs. By the time he was 25 years old, life seemed to be going pretty well for John Wayne Gacy. He had a good job, a stable family life, 
and he was a pillar of his community. But Gacy couldn't help but indulge in his interest in teenage boys. In March 1967, two 16-year-old boys went to the police and told them that Gacy had been sexually abusing them. Two months later, Gacy was indicted for sodomy. He denied the allegations against him. At the end of August, Gacy hired an 18-year-old man to beat up one of the boys who went to the police. After he was sprayed with mace and punched a few times, the boy was able to fight off his attacker and he called the police. The 18-year-old was arrested and he told the police that Gacy had hired him. Gacy ended up pleading guilty to sodomy and he was sentenced to 10 years of prison. Not long after he was sent to prison, his wife divorced him and he never saw his children again. Gacy ended up serving 18 months and he was released. During Gacy's 18 month prison stint, his father died and Gacy wasn't allowed to attend the funeral. After he was paroled, Gacy moved in to his mother's home in Chicago and he worked as a chef. In 1971, Gacy's life seemed to be turning around. He was 29 years old, he was off parole, and he was running his own business called PDM Contracting. He had also purchased a house with his mother in Norway Park Township, which is just outside of Chicago. On January 3rd, 1972, Gacy went to a visitation for a deceased family member and afterward, he went to a relative's home for dinner. Several hours later, he left his relative's house and as he was heading home, he drove by the Greyhound station. He found a teenage boy at the station and he convinced the boy to come back to his house. Once there, they supposedly had consensual sex. The next morning, the boy came into Gacy's bedroom and he was holding a knife. Gacy got the knife away from the boy and stabbed him to death. It turned out that the boy had made Gacy breakfast. He probably just forgot to put the knife down when he went to Gacy's bedroom and Gacy thought that the boy was going to attack him. Gacy considered the death self-defense, but he didn't call the police. Instead, he buried the young man in a crawl space under his house. Gacy never asked the young man what his name was. He would not be identified until 1985, 13 years after his murder. He was 16-year-old Timothy McCoy. He lived in Glenwood, Iowa and he had been visiting a relative in Michigan. He was waiting for the bus to take him home when he encountered Gacy. Six months later, Gacy got married for the second time. After moving in, his wife complained about an odd odor that lingered in the house. Gacy knew what the smell was, and he covered the remains of the young man in cement when his wife was out of town for a weekend. Sometime in January 1974, two years after he killed his first victim, Gacy killed a teenage boy and buried him in his backyard. The young man, who was between the ages of 14 and 18, has never been identified. In 1975, Gacy was 33 years old and he was a member of the Moose Club, which is a fraternal organization. It was there that I learned about a group called the Jolly Jokers Club. They were a group of guys who dressed up as clowns for fundraising events, they marched in parades, and they performed at children's birthday parties and at the hospital. Gacy joined the group, and sometimes he performed as Patches the Clown. But most of the time, he performed as Pogo the Clown. Gacy said he chose the name because he had a Polish heritage and he was always on the go. For his clown alter egos, Gacy did his own makeup. One thing the other members of the group noticed was that Gacy drew sharp points around his mouth 
and his eyes. Most clowns use rounded designs because they are less intimidating to children. Around the same time that Gacy started clowning, he became director of Chicago's annual Polish Day Parade. Looking from the outside in, Gacy seemed like nothing but an upstanding citizen. But problems were brewing inside Gacy's home. Less than three years into his second marriage, Gacy told his wife their relationship would no longer be sexual because he was more attracted to men. Understandably, his wife moved out and asked for a divorce. Gacy often employed teenage boys for his contracting business. Not long after his wife moved out, on July 31, 1975, one of his employees, 17-year-old John Bukovich, vanished. John's family asked the police to investigate Gacy, but it's unclear if they did. Gacy was a prominent member of the community and he was friends with several police officers. But John's family was right in suspecting that Gacy was involved in his disappearance. Gacy had strangled the 17 year old to death and buried his body in the floor of his garage. Gacy wouldn't kill again for another 10 months. Then in April 1976, he murdered 18 year old Daryl Sampson. Gacy buried him under the floor of his dining room. Just over a month later, he killed two teenage boys on the same day. On May 16, 1976, Gacy kidnapped 15-year-old Randall Reffitt as he was walking home from school. Gacy gagged Randall with a cloth and he choked to death. Hours later, Gacy kidnapped 14-year-old Samuel Stapleton who was walking home from his sister's apartment. After killing Samuel, Gacy buried both bodies in the crawl space. Just over three weeks later, 17-year-old Michael Bonin was supposed to take the train from Chicago to Waukegan, Illinois. Sadly, he never made it there because Gacy kidnapped, strangled, and buried him in his crawl space. Ten days later, Gacy kidnapped and killed 16-year-old William Carroll. Sometime between mid-June and early August 1976, Gacy killed another teenage boy, but his identity is unknown to this day. It's believed that Gacy killed 16-year-old James Hawkinson, who was from Minnesota, on August 5th. The next day, it's suspected that Gacy strangled 17-year-old Rick Johnson. James was buried directly beneath Rick in the crawl space. Between August 6 and October 24th, Gacy killed two more teenage boys. Neither body has been identified. On October 24, 1976, Gacy kidnapped a pair of friends, 16-year-old Kenneth Parker and 14-year-old Michael Marino. Two days later, Gacy lured 19-year-old William Bundy to his home. Bundy worked in construction, and Gacy promised him a job. But instead, Gacy killed him and buried him in the crawl space. On December 12, 1976, 17-year-old Gregory Godzik went missing. Three weeks before he went missing, Gregory started working for Gacy's contracting company. He told his family he had been digging ditch-like holes in the crawl space below Gacy's house. Gregory's family asked Gacy if they knew where he was. Gacy said that Gregory had run away and he didn't know where he went. By the time 1976 came to an end, Gacy had killed at least 17 young men. 15 of them were killed in 1976. Except for Timothy McCoy, Gacy's first victim whom he stabbed to death, all of his victims were asphyxiated to death. All of the bodies were buried around his property. Most of them were buried in the crawl space beneath his house. 
The first half of 1977 was a relatively quiet period for Gacy. On January 20th, he killed 19-year-old John Sick after luring him into his house. He buried him directly above Gregory Godzik in the crawl space. On March 15th, Gacy killed 20-year-old John Prestige, who was visiting Chicago from Michigan. In the first quarter of 1977, or early 1976, Gacy killed a man who was between the ages of 22 and 32, but he hasn't been identified. Also, sometime between March and early July, Gacy killed a young man that he didn't know and hasn't been identified. On July 5th, 1977, Gacy used a tourniquet to choke the life out of 19-year-old Matthew Bowman. Gacy buried him in the crawl space with the tourniquet still wrapped around his throat. Two months later, on September 15th, Gacy suffocated 18-year-old Robert Gilroy who was the son of a police sergeant. Like most of Gacy's victims, he was buried in the crawl space. Ten days later, Gacy killed 19-year-old John Mowry. Mowry's roommate was an employee of Gacy's. On October 17, 1977, Russell Nelson, who lived in Minnesota, was visiting Chicago. He went missing that night after visiting a bar. Gacy had strangled him and buried his body in his own personal graveyard beneath his house. On November 10th, 1977, Gacy killed 16-year-old Robert Winch and then eight days later, he strangled 20-year-old Tommy Bowling to death. Gacy committed his first murder of 1977 on December 9th. 19-year-old David Talsma was heading to a concert in Hammond, Illinois. It's unclear if he made it to the concert, but he did not come home. Gacy had killed him and buried him in the crawl space. On December 30th, 1977, Gacy kidnapped 19-year-old Robert Donnelly. Donnelly was waiting at a bus stop when Gacy pulled a gun on him and made him get into his car. Gacy took him home and tortured him. This included holding his head underwater in a bathtub until he lost consciousness and then Gacy revived him. Inexplicably, Gacy let him go after several hours. Donnelly went to the police and officers interviewed Gacy less than a week later. Gacy told the officers that everything they did was consensual. The officers believed him, so nothing was done. Gacy's body count for 1977 was 11 men, making his total number of victims 28. Gacy's first victim of 1978 was 19-year-old William Kindred. Gacy killed him on February 16th. During his killing spree, Gacy had maintained an outstanding reputation in the community. He continued to do volunteer work, and he performed as either Pogo or Patches the Clown. In May 1978, because he was the director of the Polish Constitution Day Parade, Gacy met with then First Lady Rosalind Carter, and they were photographed together. Gacy also hosted large parties at his home for his friends and neighbors. When people were inside his house, they noticed a strange and unsettling odor. The odor was the 29 bodies that were buried around his property. 26 of the bodies were in the crawl space. But after Gacy buried William Kindred in the crawl space, he ran into a problem. He had no more room to hide any of the bodies in the crawl space. But that didn't stop Gacy from killing. In mid June 1978, Gacy murdered 20 year old Timothy O'Rourke and threw his body from the I 55 bridge into the De Plains River. O'Rourke's body was found on June 20th, several days after he went missing. 
It is believed that Gacy went the whole summer without killing anyone. Now, on November 4th, 1978, he murdered Frank Lanigan and tossed his body into the river. Twenty days later, he did the same thing to 20-year-old James Moraza. On December 11th, Gacy was at a pharmacy and he started talking to 15-year-old Robert Pice, who was stocking shelves. Robert's mother was waiting for him outside to drive him home after his shift. Shortly before his shift was about to end, Robert came out and told his mother that a contractor wanted to talk to him about a job and he would be a few minutes. His mother lost sight of him as he went back into the store. She sat in her car and continued to wait for him, but he never came back to the car. She got out of the car and started looking for him, but he was gone. She talked to the owner of the pharmacy and learned that the contractor that Robert had been talking to was John Wayne Gacy. She called the police and told them that Robert had gone missing and the last person he was talking to was Gacy. An officer went to Gacy's house and he asked Gacy if he could come to the police station for an interview. Gacy said that he couldn't come at that moment because there had been a death in his family and he had to make phone calls, but he said he would come to the station later that night. The officer told him that was fine and he left Gacy alone. What Gacy told the officer was true. His uncle had died that night and he was making phone calls. But in between the calls, he tortured and killed 15-year-old Robert Peist. He dumped Robert's body off the I-55 bridge and then he went to the police station. At the police station, Gacy answered some questions, but he wasn't arrested and he went home after the interview. The police officer who interviewed Gacy decided to look at his record and he was surprised that Gacy had served 18 months for sodomy. The police officer decided to get a warrant to look inside Gacy's house. The day after Robert Pice went missing, officers searched Gacy's house. They noticed an awful smell coming from the crawl space, but they just assumed it was a broken sewage line. The police collected some evidence and then they left. Gacy wasn't arrested but he was put under 24-hour surveillance. While he was being watched by the police, Gacy acted oddly. At first, he tried to befriend the police who were following him, and he even bought them dinner. He also told them where he was going. But then other times, he tried to outrun the police and lose them. A week after the police searched his house, Gacy drove to a Shell gas station while officers followed him. When he got to the station, he got out of his car and forced a teenage attendant to take a bag of marijuana from him. The police caught him doing this and he was arrested. The next day, the police uncovered three bodies in Gacy's crawl space. They also found several rings that belonged to young men who were reported missing. Gacy then confessed to killing 33 young men. He drew a map of his property and indicated where the police could find the remains of 29 of his victims. He said he dumped the other four bodies in the river. Gacy explained that he usually lured young men into his house with the promise of work. He would then give them an alcoholic drink. With many of his victims, he talked about clowning. A lot of the time the topic would come up because his victims would ask about the clown decorations that adorned his house. He would then offer to show them a trick he performed that involved handcuffs. They would agree and then Gacy would put handcuffs on them. They wouldn't realize it was a trap until it was too late. Gacy said he killed most of his victims by asphyxiating them to death with a tourniquet. In February 1980, Gacy went to trial for 33 murders. 
only 22 victims had been identified. Gacy was convicted on all counts and he was sentenced to death. After he was convicted, he recanted his confession. As proof of his innocence, he said that he would not have been able to fit in the crawl space. Gacy gained even more notoriety while he was in prison. With Gacy's permission, a lawyer had set up a 1-900 number where, for $1.99 a minute, people could listen to Gacy talk about how he was innocent. Gacy also sold his paintings for $100 to $200 a piece. Gacy was supposed to be executed at midnight on May 10th, 1994, but there was a problem with the lethal injection process. There was gelling in one of the delivery tubes, so the execution was delayed by an hour. For his last words, Gacy could have expressed remorse, or he could have asked for forgiveness from the families of the 33 young men that he killed. But he didn't. Instead, his last words were, Kiss my ass. Gacy was pronounced dead at 12.58 a.m. on May 10th, 1994, at the age of 52. At the time of this video, six of Gacy's victims have yet to be identified. In July 2018, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children released sketches of what two of the victims may have looked like. The first was a young man who was killed between August 6th and October 5th, 1976. He was white, probably between the ages of 17 and 21, and he was somewhere between 5'7 and 5'11. Before he was killed, he had injured his left clavicle and it had healed. The second sketch is a victim who was killed between March 15th and July 5th, 1977. He was white, had wavy brown hair, he was most likely 18 to 21 years old, and he was 5'9 to 6'2. One of his upper teeth was displaced by another tooth. The National Center for Missing and Exploited Children is hoping that they will be able to identify the two young men so that their families can be given some closure. Between 1972 and 1977, Gacy killed 33 young men, but the police think it's possible that he killed other young men as well. Unfortunately, we may never know the true level of carnage caused by John Wayne Gacy. Thank you so much for watching today's video. Hopefully you found it interesting. If you did, please give us a thumbs up and subscribe for more videos just like it. Also, please go to criminallylisted.com where you can suggest cases, buy merch, and find out about an exclusive podcast. But that's all for today. Thanks again for watching.